Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. What a wonderful crowd. Uh, welcome to Atlantic Convention Headquarters. It's so wonderful to see such a, a, a large group of you here. Um, I hope you're all feeling well fed and, and ready for what we hope will be a meaningful conversation about the state of education in this country and how to ensure quality education across the board. Uh, we're calling this session Building Blocks, Changing the Frame on Education. And I, and I want to start out by thanking our underwriters, the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association for making this possible. Thank you. Our, our first conversation is a view from the Hill, four Democratic members of Congress who are intensely focused on education. First up, Donna Edwards represents Maryland, D.C. suburbs. She co-chairs the House Democrat Steering and Policy Committee, which advises part party leaders on policy issues. Welcome, Congresswoman. <laughs> Suzanne Bonamici represents Oregon and is a member of the House Education Committee. Welcome. And uh, so is Con Connecticut Qu Congressman jo Joe Courtney. Welcome, Congressman. Um, and Virginia's Bobby Scott is the ranking Democrat on the House Education and Workforce Committee. Um, uh, Congressman, I want to make it easy for you by sitting on the end because I know you are kind enough to grace us with your presence here and that you're going to have to dash. So, and with that, I welcome my colleague, Steve Clemens, Washington editor at large. I'll, I'll you can go right there. It's okay. I thought I was hey, supposed to go the other door. No one can hear me here right now. Is this not working? Uh, hello, hello. How many of you are teachers? Okay, how many of you run after school or something community centers? How many are you involved in health care, health issues in any way? How many of you are parents? Lots of you. How many of you haven't put up your hands yet? <laughs> okay, so we're going to get to a couple of you to kind of kind of work around the room. The, I, the kind of conversation I want to have today is I'm so tired of the silos. Oh, we're going to discuss education policy. I want to discuss society today. I want to discuss how to get it right. Why is it so hard? Why do you have to fight uphill? Where does education fit in it? And I want us all to have a little, you know, pretend we're at lunch and eating something. Too bad we're not, folks. That's a hint. Uh, um, but let, let's have a conversation. I want to start with, with Bobby because I know you've got to leave. But I, I just want to say, let's make you president, right? And president where you control, <laughs> <laughs> where your party controls both houses of Congress and you can just be smart and do what you want to do, and you don't really have to watch your back too much, right? You're popular. What would you do to kind of put this issue behind us so that everyone has a, has a fair chance at a good education and that we knock out the bias? Just what would you do? Give us just a couple of minutes on, on, on your script. Well, I think we need to follow through on... Um the federal role in education, starting with that the, sounds so boring. Start, starting, to me. starting with well, <laughs> yeah, the federal but, role in education. Well, you start. You, you, so you start with the Brown. You me. start with the Brown decision, where the court said that uh, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if denied the opportunity to an education. And such an opportunity is a right, which must be made available to all on equal terms. Right. Uh, then, then so you the, would make that real. Well, then we we tried to make it real with ESCA. Uh, we put money into it with the focus on uh, because of the challenges of educating low-income students, particularly in high concentrations of poverty, we put money into those areas under the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, then No Child Left Behind, with all its problems, did look at uh, the disparities, making sure all children can learn. If You have, you have to ascertain whether there are achievement gaps and then do something about it. And, and um, uh, the last step is making sure uh, the ESA, ESSA, which um, uh, we just passed, doesn't tell the students, uh, localities, states and localities how to do it, but you still have to ascertain achievement gaps, do something about it. And we also looked at resource equity to make sure that uh, you're resourcing your schools uh, equally. We, we fundamentally fund schools on the real estate tax, so you know there's going to be a problem. But um, when we did ES, uh, ESSA, there were a lot of challenges. So this is the, just so for, for those of you who don't follow the, you know, the Department of Defense style lingo in the education world, that's the Every Student Succeeds Act. I right? think most, most, yeah. uh, most, I think teachers were so happy to get rid of No Child Left Behind that they, you can call it anything you want to call <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, but but we, made, we needed to make sure that we continue to ascertain whether there's an achievement gap and do something about it. The, the challenge was 
that the um, others wanted to take money away, um, move, move it away from concentrations of poverty, eliminate the responsibility of doing any testing so you don't know whether there's an achievement gap, and if you luck up and find there's an achievement gap, you don't have to do anything about it. I think there, there are things that we need to do to make sure that we continue making progress and not turn, turn the clock back. And so if, what, what we need to do, we have to make sure that everybody has that excellent opportunity for an education, because if we don't have, that is our competitive advantage. Uh, when you talk about a global economy, our advantage is a well-educated workforce. And if we lose that, uh, we, we're not going to win on low wages. We're not going to win on you have to be close to your customers because you can be anywhere you want with, uh, with technology. Well-educated workforce is, is what we have. And if we don't have well-educated people, we're going to just lose in the global economy. And that's why it's so important uh, for people to get a good education. They're less likely to be involved in crime, less likely right. to need public assistance. I mean, it's, it, it, your, your entire um, culture is, it revolves around uh, education. So if we lose on that, we just lose altogether. Be before you go, and I know you've got to zip out of here, you've been in Congress for 24 years. Can you give us the worst moments in education? <laughs> Can you just tell us what has gone really badly when you've been there? Why are we where we are today and having this forum? Are there things that could have happened over uh, your, your uh, well, service? Well, if you look at the Every Student Succeeds Act, it uh, started out H.R. 5 in, in, in the House, which was a very different bill. They cut back uh, the money. They, they eliminated the um, uh, requirement that you, uh, maintain, uh, you maintain your services. A supplant not uh, replaced was eliminated, um, and they eliminated responsibilities for testing. They eliminated responsibilities for doing anything about it. Just give me the money and do what you want. Um, I think you're, that, you're that was a lot going. That, that that was that was a low point. And by the time we finished the bill, yeah. we had uh, corrected a lot of that. And I think we have a bill. If if the localities, states and localities, do what they're supposed to do, right? I don't think they can do worse than the federal government was doing. But there's a lot of opportunity to make improvements under that legislation. Well, thank you very much. Good. I thank you. you got to run. Thank you. A round of applause for Bobby Scott. Thank, thank you. you thank you, Steve. Welcome to our uh, variety of show. Now, uh, <laughs> we've got a few people left. Donna, let me, let me come to you. you you've, you've also, I know, we, we've happened thank to know you. each other for a long period of time before all of this. And I know with ARCA Foundation yeah, and you. before you went to Congress, sorry, uh, essentially trying to deal with these these stakeholding societal equity issues has been something you've been driven by. Has, has your time in Congress been fruitful or would you, do you, I mean, I'm interested in whether legislators can make a difference on this stuff. So I'm asking you to kind of grade how you felt the last few years have gone. Right, and you're saying, oh, since you're like on your way out. <laughs> no, now no, I mean, I'm very slide. happy for you to stay in. So, so here's, I mean, I always think that um, we have to approach education as though we were talking about educating, as policymakers, that we're educating our own children. Right. Um, because I think that has to be a basic frame. What do you want for your child? Uh, do you want your child to go to a school that um, has books that are 20 years old? Do you want your child to go to a school that has labs that were made in the 1970s for technology that's in the 21st century? All of those things. And I don't think we ask ourselves enough of those, uh, of those questions for our own children in order to then make a determination about what would be a good idea for other people's children. Um, and I, I do, uh, when I think about education, I approach it from the standpoint of a parent. Um, my, when my son was... Um, in school, he's 28 now, thankfully, successfully out, but he had really severe learning disabilities. It made it very difficult for him uh, to read. It turns out that he had really high intellect and low performance. And had I just sort of left him in that environment to the devices of the system, um, he would have been stuck in some class saying he's never going to be anything. In fact, I did have people right. telling me he's never going to be able to really read he probably won't go to college. I mean, they said all of those negatives, and it turns out that they were so wrong because we have an education system that's really has not been focused on what do I want for my child. And I decided that what I wanted for my child is that I wasn't going to believe all of that stuff. Mm. And so all of the things that people said turned out to, to be true to my, for my child, but I want that to be true for everybody else's child too. And so I do believe that 
children have enormous capacity. And when you, you know, I spent a lot of time going around to schools, especially as I was, you know, just running for that uh, Senate seat in, right. in Maryland and spending time in Baltimore City schools, uh, for example, with kids who knew that they were being deprived. Kids are so smart and they know it and they don't like it and they're pissed off about it. And I, I think that we have to have policymakers who get as pissed off as those kids about the fact so, that they're not getting So let's getting go to those kids. kids. I want to open it up to all, everybody uh, here. But on the, on the broad notion, they felt they were being deprived. One of the uh, things I want to talk today is about education as a, as a civic right, as a human right in our system, as something uh, where that environment should be available to, to everyone. And yet you're describing something where folks in the Balt inner city Baltimore city schools felt as if they weren't getting that. How, why, why is this so hard? Well, I mean, yeah. when you asked Bobby the low yeah. point, I mean, I think, and, and Susan and, and Donna can, I think, attest to this. You know, we've been in a, in a political environment on the Hill where there are people who just do not believe that this is a national policy issue. Education is just all sort of outside of uh, the national purview and that it's what not a priority. What percentage of Congress carries well, I, that? Viewpoint? I mean, H.R. 5, which he described yeah. when you look at it, was basically just a total rollback in terms of Title I, which is the workhorse right. For, right. from the federal government helping uh, low-income kids across the country, and, and just basically sort of blowing up any sort of um, notion that we, as a nation, uh, have to make this a priority if we're going to succeed in the future for all the reasons that, that Bobby laid out. Uh, again, the, the bill that emerged uh, was, I think, you know, somewhat better balanced in terms of protecting a national sort of uh, uh, vision. If you look at the Democratic pa platform, uh, by the way, we are at a Democratic convention. It actually reasserts that as a national priority of a Clinton administration. And, and you look at the other side, and I mean, I don't, it was just, radio silence, you know, right. in terms of... Yeah, I want to weigh in. Saying, I, as yeah, a yeah. product of public schools myself, whose kids went through public schools, public schools give everyone in this country an opportunity to be successful. And there definitely is a federal role in there. And that's what Joe's talking about when we hear this pushback about, well, especially with uh, things like the child nutrition program. The parents should be feeding their children. It's not the federal government's responsibility to feed children. Mm -hmm. So I want to back up a step. I and mean, that's what we're right. hearing. And that's the pushback we yeah. get. I want to back up a step to your question you asked Representative Scott about what would you do, I would start really early with like prenatal care, paid family leave, affordable child care, and when you have those policies in place, which um, I hope we'll be able to continue to work on in the Clinton administration, when you have those policies in place so that ch children get a more equal start when they're starting school, you give them more of an opportunity to be successful. But we also have to, to address the funding inequities. In my home state of Oregon, uh, funding is through the state, not through local. It's not property taxes. So now it's competing with uh, health and human services and public safety. But uh, it was an effort to try to, to equalize funding. And that's exactly what the Title I dollars are intended to do. Um, and, but we also need to make sure that students, when they get to school, are getting a well-rounded education that engages them, that allows them the opportunity to uh, show their own unique talents. I'm a big supporter of arts education. I'm the uh, founder of the STEAM caucus because I'm also on the science committee and everybody talks about <laughs> right. STEM yeah. and everybody talks about STEM and the, educa and the education committee. Steam, Nobody's talking steam about arts STEM, education. Yeah. And right. so STEAM is to integrate the arts so that we have uh, arts education uh, because students need that because they need to be critical, creative thinkers. We have a lot of big right. problems in this country. We need people who have a new way of looking at things, a new creative approach to solving problems. But it was but, a knockdown what, drag out right. fight to get any STEM language yeah. in the right, education but, bill. Even though every right. employer group, whether it's agriculture to finance to manufacturing, mm -hmm. is screaming. For, for this type of skill set to get prioritized. And, right. and, and I, again, because well, this like laissez fair you know, attitude that um, right. you know, let somehow it all just sort of happen uh, by I, course I think of nature. Take a look, I mean, it, and take, if you take a look at, I, I think one of the pro huge problems that we have is that there is a complete mismatch between the education and training that goes in pre-K, K to 12, and what employers need. 
Right. I mean, it's the gigantic mismatch, and then that mismatch continues on into college education for um, young people who are going on uh, on to college. And so I think there and has really to be a broader conversation. I really time for a two-day forum on that topic. It's a huge <laughs> it's, subject, it's right? right. I mean, I, what you just well, because said if we is, don't, then yeah. we continue to get the pre-K to 12 wrong. Right. You know, and so then you have you know young people who sure. are coming out. Some, many of whom, will go directly into the workforce. Right. They will. I mean, this idea that we've been focused on that every single child is going to go to community college and college that is going to be true for a lot of people, but it's not going to be true for all of our children. And so there has to be more continuity from pre-K to 12 and on to whatever that next step so is. Let me confess one of my frustrations with m the many, many, many education forums I've participated in. It's such a fuzzy subject. I agree with everything you said, but I can also agree with something that others have said in terms of their priorities. And what I'm interested in is, you know, in science, in healthcare, in national security, there's a greater clarity of what works versus what doesn't. And it's interesting to me that this field remains so fuzzy that you can have people, you know, that are, that are, that are in the same box and maybe even with the same intentions of trying to produce, uh, I don't think everyone on the other side is laissez-faire, but I'm just wondering, what do you think can be done on the policy side and also working with communities? I asked the question of where people were in the communities to actually move the needle a little bit more than we're doing. It can't all just be ESSA. What are the other missing pieces of the educational picture that, that, that you think you can move the needle, that give get greater clarity and said, here's, here's the right choice, here's the wrong choice? Well, I certainly, um, uh, as is part of the Every Student Succeeds Act is part of it. Uh, but one of the things I do want to mention, we really we do have good data and research about what works. I'll tell you what doesn't work, mm. and that's all the focus on standardized testing that we've right. seen across the country because of No Child Left Behind, and that has also resulted in uh, fewer choices for students, narrowing of curriculum, because if it wasn't tested, it wasn't a priority. So that's going to change with the Every Student Succeeds Act. So if we need assessments, of course. Teachers need to assess students, but there need to be fewer assessments, better assessments, more useful information from those assessments. Mm -hmm. So we have research about what works and what doesn't. And, and we but need to empower local stakeholders in terms exactly. of designing what are real measurements of success. Because everything, you know, and that was the, the real flaw in NCLB, is it just basically excluded teachers and administrators, people who are actually, you know, in the classroom from even participating in how you measure school success or what are well, good and, academic standards. And let's look at empowering those teachers because there was a time when, you know, a teacher has a, a classroom full of kindergartners, first graders, and says, what's the hand that I've been drawn? And then figures out a way to teach those children in the way that they can best learn. And I think one of the w reasons that this education thing becomes so fuzzy is because it is a requirement of education that we have to teach young people in the way that they can learn, not in the right. way that we want them to learn. And so that by itself makes it fuzzy. But the data are not. Mm. I mean, the data are out there that say that there are, you know, there are you know, ways in which we can in engage the entire brain of a child so that we produce a child who then is creative and who can think outside the box. And so we have that data, but there has to be the empowerment of allies on the other side of the aisle that see that. Pardon yeah, me? I have a bipartisan, 85 yeah. bipartisan members in the STEAM yeah. caucus who understand That's the importance right. of well-rounded education. And there was an, an amendment to encourage integration of, of arts and, and mm -hmm. design into We tried education. that in yeah. our science committee. Some of it um, well, there some was some skepticism worked, right? in the science committee, but also in the career and technical education bill, bipartisan support for this recognition that students need a well-rounded education. When it comes to equity, educational equity and fairness in the system, and, and, and Donna, you were getting at some of this in Baltimore, what can we do to even that out? Because it's so clear as the, I mean, society's struggling with race, society's struggling with inequality, society's struggling with a lot of things, and... You know, a lot of wealthy, power people, powerful people don't send their kids to public schools, right? At least not in some of the cities I've been in. How do we fix that? Well, I, I do think um, you can look at models where you actually have created more balance in terms of equity. So the Hartford school system uh, went magnet 
uh, you know, about 10 years ago as a result of a court decision uh, right. based on an equity lawsuit. And uh, it basically brought in the suburban communities, including my daughter, uh, who participated in high school in one of the magnet schools. And it really has br broken down racial isolation mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the city. It's, I mean, the New York Times did a, a wonderful piece sort of uh, lauding those results. And again, th that may not be exactly the same model for Baltimore or other parts of the country, but there, mm -hmm. there are, in fact, success models that are out there. One of the things, yeah. funding and equities are part of it, and we need to fix that. But I, wa I want to mention the infrastructure, too. Uh, you know, it's not just Flint, Michigan, that has lead in the water. Portland right. Public Schools in Oregon, some of them have. So we have to deal with this infrastructure, too, and make sure that um, students are in a school building that is safe, where they right. can drink the water, where they have uh, rooms in there. I've been in some of these schools with tiny little unheated or uh, classrooms that are so hot you can hardly focus and with no windows because the school is so crowded so we need to address that issue as well and that's going to bring some some equity if we can find a way to uh, work with our state and local leaders on that that challenging issue to make sure that our school buildings are safe places for not only our students but all, all the great teachers and staff who work with them. Donna? But we do have to change the, uh, change a model for funding right. um, because you know, if you're if the median household incomes are you know twenty thousand dollars in one place and uh, home values are you know a hundred thousand dollars, they're not going to be resourced. And those schools right. aren't going to be resourced in the same way as other communities with you know half a million dollar you know homes or even um, more than that. And I think that we see that you know in our state. And in fact, you know, two of the worst school districts in um, in our state are in places, in areas where there are significantly lower uh, incomes and we rely on property taxes to fund the school system. And so that modeling just does not work if we want to bring real equity into are the system. Are you hopeful that that's fixable in some way? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I mean, because... I mean, I think, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think it has to be if we want this country to succeed right. because I think we have a lot of, you know, children in what we describe as this rising American electorate that is more, uh, more diverse than it ever has been before on a whole bunch of different levels. And if we don't get it right, we're going to be missing out on an entire chunk of our economy. So, well, I mean, it's in, it's in your interest yeah. um, for us to get it right. And so I want to have the, you know, I actually want to have the conversation with, you know, the white male power structure um, to say it's in, in your interest that we educate, you know, poor black and brown children. I and being from, a state that, yeah. being from a state that does not fund from primarily from property taxes, uh, it is, had made some difference, but there are still inequities. And I think of things like parental engagement. If, we, if parents are more engaged, if they're not working two jobs, so how do we bring the families in? Some of our schools are more community centers, and they're working on getting getting families engaged from the outset so that parents are more involved. Do you have a show and tell where you show models of how people sort of had pulled that together? Because I do hear these stories, and, and I've always been struck by this Morningside Heights uh, story in New York where they found um, a significant degree of truancy on Mondays, and in part it was because the parents of kids, you know, yeah. didn't, they didn't have clean clothes. And so they basically put, uh, if I have it right, Randy Weingarten will fix it, but a uh, uh, you know, laundry mat in the school helped me. And it raises this broad question of, you know, we often debate education and the options through one lens. We have a lot of debates versus charter schools versus unionized public schools. And, but I'm interested in what are the other things that can be moved. In Morningside Heights, the key difference was that laundry mat or that, the, the laundry machines. I would never have thought about that. What are the, what are the kind of bank shots that are out there that might be doable. So that again, help raise the minimum game. wage for yep. Pete's sake, yeah. so the kids, so the yeah. parents can take get their own. Yeah, washing so what, that's machine a good or, bank shot. You know, go to the laundry. <laughs> that's a, that's the biggest <laughs> bank shot today. <laughs> Donald Trump's even willing to go to ten bucks an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but make it. But I'm serious. Yeah. I'm serious about this because you know, on the one hand, we blame the parents who aren't engaged. You don't come to the PTA meetings. You're not engaged in right. your school. Yeah. Um, you don't provide sort of the extras that schools get. 
and that parent is working two and three jobs and can't do that. And so, you know, raise a wage base so that that parent actually can be a better participant mm -hmm. in their child's education. Provide, make sure that all of those families are provided health care, you know, so that the parent doesn't have to worry about taking a day off to take care of a sick child to go to school. You know, when Maryland, can I just say this yeah, last please, thing? In Maryland, when I first came into Congress, I found out that in a state that has some of the highest per capita incomes in the country, right. we also had more than 50% of our kids who were going to school hungry every single day. Mm -hmm. And I added Maryland to our, the after school suppers program, federal program. And the thing about that is that we all know that we can't go through a day's work. I can't sit here right now and it's driving me crazy because I'm hungry. Mm. And yet we send kids to school every day and they're hungry. Well, I was just going to add to Suzanne? what Donna yeah. brought it up, the extended learning opportunities before and after school programs that uh, provide some of the services, whether they be meal programs right. or uh, for, for parents who are uh, working to have a safe space where uh, students can, can have those extended learning opportunities. Those make a difference, but until we break the cycle of poverty, uh, by doing things like minimum wage, paid sick days, paid family leave, join the rest of the industrialized world and have paid family leave. So um, those are all really critical until and uh, right. we need Joe, those for equity. Uh, I want to Bank give a shout out to uh, school-based health centers, which is really a, a right. model that allows kids who um, you know are sick not have to have their parents come pick them up or go sit in an emergency room or be home alone and just get them uh, you know taken care of right there on the grounds. Again, with the Affordable Care Act did put some money out there, which unfortunately got cut off uh, after about a year or two. But I mean, you, you talk to any um, school district that has school-based health centers, uh, again, you see better student attendance. performance and attendance right. because uh, you know th these issues can get dealt with. And by the way, mental health um, is another you know big component and school-based health centers are the perfect model right there in the school mm -hmm. because people pick up behaviors you know whether it's staff or uh, teachers that uh, again you can really kind of nip in the bud if you've got medical staff right there we're getting down to Dan I want to go to the audience uh, here just in a minute but let me just do lightning round with all of you real quickly we recently did this super cool thing, and it was with uh, Checker Finn, who many of you may remember as an assistant secretary of education. He's a big charter school advocate, and Randy Weingarten, who's president of the AFT. And I asked them to trade places, to take each other's arguments and argue the strongest points of each other's case. In other words, arguing against their own, own position in a way of, or at least looking at the merits of what they saw on the other side. And I'm interested in, in the way you guys look at this educational ecosystem and what it means for the country. And there are a lot of voices in this, and they're not all Democrats. And there are, what are the strongest things we could learn from, from the other side of the equation that, that should also be brought in? Are there things that have impacted you that may not have come up through the Democratic uh, uh, ladder, if you will, but, but can give merit and, and uh, affirm some of the thoughts on the other side? Donna? That states and local jurisdictions are unique, hmm. and um, that local leaders and state leaders have a lot of good ideas and important ideas that should influence the education of their children locally. Fascinating. My, yeah. Mine is similar. It's not a one-size-fits-all world. We shouldn't have <clears throat> interventions uh, dictated from Washington, D.C. about what to do uh, if students are struggling in Jewel, Oregon, where there's one school for everybody, or in you know another state. So that uh, allowing our state and local leaders to figure out what do we do to help the students in our unique communities? I have a lot of rural, I have 25 school districts, I have a lot of rural schools. They have very different needs from the urban schools, but a lot of them are similar. So mm. it's not a one size fits all. We need to have a, a local responses. Um, Joe? I mean, system. Donna's totally right. I mean, that's been the millstone that we've had to drag around for the eight years we've yeah. been in Congress that's, together, yeah. which is that, you know, there's, you know, just. In, furious anger about Washington's over-mandated uh, role. And, um, and what's unfortunate is that became sort of a Trojan horse for undercutting support for things like Title right. I and, and right. the stuff that is really the, the, the important um, support that the federal government can provide to communities that can't do it on their own with, with weak tax uh, bases. Fascinating. I want to tell you, when I have three members of Congress talking about education from the GOP side, I plan to ask them the same thing. So, <laughs> so we'll yeah. make it all fair and square. Yeah. Let me open up to the floor. Do we have uh, uh, mics out there? Right up, right in the, the bank uh, at the bar, at the bar where I want to be. <laughs> Hi, tell us who you are. Hi, um, my name, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Holly Rigby. Um, I'm a high school teacher 
uh, in, from London, as you can probably tell from my accent. Um, and first, I'd like to say it's really inspiring to hear you talking about some of the solutions to the problems that you have here, which are very similar to what we're seeing in London at the moment. Um, but a problem that we have in London, and I think you guys also have here in the US, is teacher retention, and that mm. teachers leave the profession um, after five years in London. I think it's fairly similar here. Um, because of the pressure that's on teachers, um, because of the lack of uni unionization, and various other things, and programs like Teach for America, we have something called Teach First in the UK, right. which burns young people, young teachers out very quickly. So I just wondered what you think we can do for teachers um, in the US, great, great um, but question. also in the UK. Teacher retention. Yeah. How, how, do, how do we, I mean, look, look, and teacher pay, honestly, right? So, Donna, I'm going to make you president of the United States with, you know, will you fix this problem for us? What would you do? What would be the, the steps that you take? A lot of pressure from Randy Weingarten over there. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I, and look, I think that we have to take uh, a lot of the burden off of teachers in terms of what their responsibilities are in our schools because now they're moms and dads and they are... Um, they're social workers and they are medical professionals. They are too many things in a classroom. Uh, and we can take those burdens off of teachers by making sure that, uh, again, raising wages, lifting the economic status of, um, of uh, parents who are ed educating their children um, and not requiring our teachers to do so many other things other than teach in the classroom. Suzanne? What Donna said, but also I want to say, teachers deserve uh, respect. We need to have great respect for the teaching profession in addition to the high wages. Uh, but we also need to, as a com education community, uh, push back against uh, this notion out there that for some reason people are saying, our public schools are failing, our public schools are bad. Uh, no, they aren't. <laughs> our public schools are amazing opportunities for everybody in this country to get a great education. Can we improve them? Absolutely. We talked about a lot of ways to do that today, but let's talk about how great our public schools are in this country. Yeah, and I, I just think, again, if you look at other countries in Europe where I do think that the role of teachers is much more elevated, uh, certainly in the U.S., I, I think, A, it, it, the bully pulp pulpit in terms of just showing respect, as my colleague said, but but also just sort of really recognizing that it's something as, as important and precious to a society as the medical profession, the legal profession, and, and we are a, you know, a far right. distance from, from uh, putting Let teachers me take one on that more. level. Yeah, this gentleman, or we have, okay. I'm gonna get you next round, my friend, okay? We, you, you stay right there, and we'll come back, but yeah, right here. Hi, my name is Melissa Byrne. I normally only ask about free college, but for this panel, I was wondering, what are you doing in terms of ending tracking in public schools so that way if you're low income or if you're a student of color, you're not tracked into not going to college and also getting rid of zero tolerance programs and getting rid of the school to prison pipeline? Wow. Yep. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Panel two, uh, there's a lot there. Do we track students? That's something I didn't know. Do we actually do that? We track low income and, and, and students My of color? I don't think it's an accident that when you go into some schools, especially with um, um, students with learning differences, that you see an awful lot of young mm. black and brown boys in those classrooms. And I know, right. I, as I said, from my personal, I know that my son would have been one of them. Right. And, um, and so do we do it and actively and overtly, not really sure, but something is happening in the system that, that contributes right. to that. Bias does need to be overt. Yeah. Um, quick thoughts, Suzanne, Joe? Uh, certainly with the school to prison pipeline, we, we, we absolutely need to address that. Representative Scott's been a leader on that. He had to leave. But making sure that all students are engaged in their learning uh, so that they're more likely to stay in school, uh, give them those opportunities, whether they be sports or band or drama, uh, CTE, all of the, the courses that, that engage students and keep them engaged in school so they're less likely uh, to, to leave and either whether from boredom or not being challenged or just being frustrated. So moving away from teaching the test and, and too many standardized tests is going to help. Bringing back more career and technical education, hands-on learning will help as well. One of, one of the most important higher ed reforms I think we can make is realize that this um, problem of people sort of separating by uh, social groups uh, happens really at middle school and early high school, the counseling system that we have in this country is so out of date in terms of the kind of advice it gives to, to people about what the challenges are for a life decision um, in terms of the next step. 
And uh, if, we, if we can get that right in terms of getting um, you know, people into programs that get them college ready and also stays with them, particularly first and, and family uh, kids, so that they actually graduate, um, that's how we're going to boost uh, people's ability to, to pursue their real skills rather than getting tracked. I want to thank Joe Courtney and Suzanne Bonamici and Donna Edwards uh, for this conversation. It felt serious to me. It felt consequential and deep. And I want to thank you for you know, giving us this time. Donna, I just want to say a special thanks to you. I know you're taking a little bit of a break from all this, but I'm going to hope you're going to be back. Yes. Uh, she's so going, can I tell them what you're going to do? Uh, 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 yes. Go okay. Ahead. <laughs> no, she's going to do something I so desperately want to do. We should all do it. She's going to go take some time with her son and go to all the national parks and go spend some time doing that. We're looking forward to that. One correction there. I'm oh. going by myself. Oh, yourself. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Well, yeah. That's my, better. Uh, in any case, sorry for, for getting that wrong, but I want to say uh, thank you uh, to all of you for your service. But Donna, thank you, too, for your service. I, I you know, really uh, uh, appreciate I know how hard it has been for you to go uh, through a very tough uh, campaign that I watched in Maryland myself. Uh, and I want to say thank you to all of you for being here today, but particularly because you didn't have to be here. You could be, you could be checking out and on the road already. So thank you so much. Thanks for having thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all, and safe travels, uh, Donna Edwards. Um, and now, some perspective from our underwriters. For that, I'd like to welcome Randy Weingarten. She's the president of AFT. <laughs> Lily Eskelson Garcia is the president of the NEA. And here to lead the conversation. Dale Meza Kappa, a contributing editor of Philadelphia's Public School Notebook. The notebook describes itself as an independent, nonprofit news service focused on quality and equality in Philadelphia's public schools. Dale, Randy, Lilly, the floor is yours. Okay, and these are large chairs. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Philly. And. Um, so for both of you, so we are in a city where the teachers have been working without a contract for four years. They haven't gotten a raise in all that time. Um, so how would you describe how the environment between has changed for educators in the past few years? And is this an anomaly or uh, Philadelphia or is, uh, is the situation worse for educators? You want me to start? Okay. Um, I think what we're seeing right now gives me hope. And it's not that what you just described was a hopeful situation. But I think for uh, so many years now, since 2002 and the beginning of No Child Left Untested, you've had, you've had the reformers, and you have to put air quotes around that. It is part of the registered trademark, um, who will say, you know what, we don't have to worry about pay, we don't have to worry about benefits, we don't have to worry about class size, we don't have to worry about technology or infrastructure of our schools. Let's just um, have privatization, standardization, deprofessionalization. Those are the pillars of, of so-called reform. And now they've had 14 years, and both parties, party to it, to say, and here's what you get for that. And what we got was test and punish. What we got was the corruption of what it means to teach and what it means to learn. And they have absolutely no research, no evidence, nothing to point to that it moved the needle on true <coughs> um, achievement for some of our most vulnerable children. And so they're so desperate that folks are now coming and saying, so like, maybe we should go talk to a teacher. Maybe we should ask a kindergarten teacher or a special ed teacher what their ideas are. And we have ideas about what we need uh, to teach and what we need to learn. And it's the opposite of test and punish. It's how do you humanize? How do you have the most qualified, prepared career professionals? And how do you give them collaborative authority to make true decisions? And that is what our global competition that people keep saying uh, we're supposed to come up against, that's what they do. And now folks are, I think, very um, quickly abandoning that test and punish model, and they're moving towards something that actually works. Randy, I mean, you've been in Philly a lot during the last few years. I um, feel like I live here. Right. 
Um, but what do you think it says yeah. that the, the one of the largest school districts in, right. the, in the country can't come to an agreement and instead of focusing together on some of the issues that a lot of the educators agree on, that Lily just talked about, they're fighting and, and it's a big problem. What does that say about the state of the profession and the unions? So I think we have, um, we have a tale of two states of education now. Um, I think Lily is completely right about what is happening nationally. We've seen the environment shift nationally. You would never have had, an, and, and look, let me just say this. This room is full, full house at the field house, <laughs> on talking about what to do about education, as opposed to being in a crouched position defending the inane insanity that Lily just talked about for the last 15 years of testing, 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 austerity, 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 privatization, and competition. So that gives you a sense that the environment has shifted. But there is, when I say that there's a tale of two cities, do you see that the environment hasn't shifted yet in the places that need the most? Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia. The, the environment in terms of who's been elected, Governor Wolf has tried to, he's been heroic in trying to deal with equity in Harrisburg. And he has been met with obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, which goes directly to why Philadelphia schools are still being starved. And I want to give tremendous credit to both Mayor Kenny, Jerry Jordan, our members and the community because what they have done and we have done is done the fight that says public education is a sacred right and we are going to do brick by brick, pull together um, and, and keep this together, but we need the resources to nurture, respect teachers, to get the programs like early childhood, to get the things that Susan Bonanici and Joe Courtney and Donna Edwards and, and Representative Scott were talking about. And so this is where we are is change in the environment, but the places at most risk have not felt it in the classroom and on the ground. And what I'm starting to see, at least in terms of my own membership, and community groups is that we're getting together to actually now make the same fights that we've done nationally, now make them locally, and I just want to say a hosanna to that because that's where the fight now must be in terms of fighting against austerity and fighting against privatization and fighting to make sure that public education is a public good for all children, all children. Okay, so NCLB is dead. There's ESSA. Or Can we just hear it for that? The yeah. There every, is no AYP. Right. Every oh. Child Succeeds Act. Um, <clears throat> so what are the opportunities in that law? I mean, you just talked about equity at every child. Well, you know, they spend about $12,000 a year per student in Philadelphia. You walk across the street, literally, into Lower Marion. They spend twice as much that's been talked about. So what are the opportunities in ESSA for equity and for doing something about the uh, the this kids in Philly, there were 190 teacher vacancies for the entire school year. They, kids didn't have teachers. They didn't have substitutes. It was, you know, it was, they don't have art and music, many of them, nurses, et cetera, et cetera. Helen will tell you a lot more about that. But, you know, how, what are the opportunities in ESSA to do something about this? I think the biggest opportunity is to start talking about what is fundamental um, and fundamentally not said that what you just described has institutional racism written all over it. And people hate to use the word racism. That is exactly how we fund our schools. It's the expectation of which kids, of course, are gonna get sports and the arts and AP classes. And no one thinks that that's bad, it's wonderful. And which kids, of course, are not. They're gonna get test and punished. They're gonna get um, basic uh, literacy, and they're gonna get nothing that doesn't fit on a standardized test. So with ESSA, um, and the best way I can think of to um, describe what we think it could, it could be, you have to have now, state to state, you have to develop a dashboard of multiple indicators of success, and we got something that none of us thought we would get, because at least one indicator, and at least is the, <coughs> the language that means it could be 20 indicators, but at least one indicator of service and support. 
And so our vision is that um, you should, on this dashboard of indicators, uh, that will tell you which kids are getting, because it's still disaggregated information, which kids are getting everything they need and which kids are getting shortchanged, we've suggested that you should walk into the most highly resourced public elementary, middle, and high school in your state. Um, every, you usually have to drive through the McMansions to find it, and then you find this incredible school. And, and uh, they have a theater department, and they have a, a chemistry lab, and they have a library full of technology, and they have a professional librarian, and a school nurse, and a school psychologist, and enough counselors to actually counsel kids. And they have a decent class size. And they've got everything because they have very affluent parents who say, this is what my kid needs to give them an advantage on their competition, that's your kid, in college. And they're right. They're right, and they know exactly what to fight for for their kids. And that is what every child deserves. But can, so, acknowledging that to be true, I mean, what is, what is, is so has this, there been an advance that might lead to some of the recognition and correction of this kind of inequity that's b b baked right into our educational system? So this is what ESSA does and doesn't do. It allows you the space for states to do the right thing, but states could also do the wrong thing. It is a reset and allows you the space. So if you said what Lily said before, Five years ago, somebody would say, oh no, but testing is the be all and the end all, and the only thing that counts is that English and math test three through eight and one through high school. And now the accountability system has been changed to enable that. So let me say it this way. If, if we need, and there's a lot of people who believe in public education in this room, but we need to make this belief system much broader, just like um, Congresswoman Bonanici and Congressman Courtney said. So it is not just about what the affluent schools have, but every child should deserves to have an engaged curriculum where we spark critical thinking and creativity. That takes resources, that takes skills and knowledge. Every child deserves us to actually meet their individual needs and start with where their well-being, particularly since half our kids are poor in public schools. Every child deserves to have the capacity built of a teaching force and a principal force. All of that takes investment and it takes collaboration to do it. What ESSA enables is that it enables it as a law that allows every district to do that and every state to do that. But that's only going to happen if we have local fights to ensure that that happens. And that also takes equity and that takes the work of community, parents, teachers, students, and the broader community together. That's what ESSA does. All right, so just one other, one last quick question, which is, okay, Hillary Trump, okay. <laughs> What's the difference the between them is, and what? No. <laughs> okay, and, and what do you, relationship do you think the Clinton administration is gonna have with educators, specifically the unions, but education in general? Um, so, Trump has, you know, Trump basically has fear, bigotry, racism, misogyny. And let's continue to divide the country and divide the country. You know, he has, you know, you can just see what his proposals are on education by simply saying, looking at Trump University and the fact that he just exploited poor women, single mothers to take useless courses and things like that. And his son basically got up on stage and basically insulted every single parent and every single school teacher that actually has tried to help every single student in America. That's Trump's policy. That's his position. So, you know, do we want the Trump effect? Do we want more bullying in schools? Do we want no money for public schools? Do we want that? That's who he is. What Hillary has done is spent her entire life focusing on how we help students achieve from students with special needs to students who get, you know, are born with a silver spoon in their mouths, from students who are ethnically diverse to students who are not. And the ultimately, as Lily says more than, more than I do, she listens to people all the time. So the choice is, do we want somebody who actually says there's no silver bullet, but we're gonna do everything in our power to actually try to grow our, 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 our 
the country and to enable people through public education? Or do we want somebody who's going to divide and be a bigot? That's the choice we have. Um, it's a choice between a woman who has lived a life of service and a man who is a self-serving life. And a woman who wrote a book called It Takes a Village to Raise a Child and a man who wrote a book called The Art of the Deal that my dad had to co-sign for me. Um, <laughs> there is no choice here. Hillary Clinton will respect the voices of educators. She started her career fighting for special education students to get the services that they need. It's in her platform on her website. If you haven't gone up and looked on her website to see what she says she would prioritize in education, it is, we could have written that. And I think we actually kind of did because she asked so many educators, what's important to you? I want someone who will listen to me. I want someone who will respect my voice as a teacher. And that someone is Hillary Clinton. All right, well, thanks. Thank you so much, Dale. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Lily. And now another take on how to ensure quality education from a teacher a politician and parent, and from an advocate. So for that, please welcome Montserrat Garabay. She is a pre-K teacher from Austin, Texas. Hello. Helen Gim is a councilwoman at large, <laughs> clearly well known in this city. Uh, Helen Gim is a councilwoman at large for the Philadelphia City Council and is co-founder of Parents United for Public Well Education. Welcome. And Sophia Bush is an education advocate and an actress you might know her as Detective Erin Lindsay in the TV series Chicago PD, and she is passionate about the importance of educating girls. Welcome, Sophia. And now, back to lead the conversation, my colleague, Steve Clemens. Hello, everybody. I was going to change ties, but uh, maybe I'm going to take off tie. I, there, we, we, have another, we have another member of our, our, our panel, in a way. I'm going to call Destiny, stand up for a minute. This is Destiny. She is from Mount View High School. She's from McDowell County, West Virginia. Will all of the McDowell High School kids just yell or wave? You're like way back there in the corner near the... Uh, Woo! They're all near the computer games. But uh, I want to just say a special welcome. There may be other students here, but you know, part of these discussions about get an education right, sometimes we don't have the students in the room. McDowell County is one that I feel particularly strongly about. It's been profiled as one of the least resourced counties in, in America that the community is trying to come together with. I remember uh, attending a gathering that Randy Weingarten had put together on Joe Manchin's boat. So Senator Joe Manchin, we had Lamar Alexander, a Republican, Shelley Moore Capito, a Republican. We had Chuck Schumer, a Democrat, and Joe Manchin, and McDowell County and what was going on there. So Destiny, get your questions ready and comments because I'm gonna come back to you and you're gonna be special, so make it smart. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna come back. But, but let me just open up um, to, to kind of start the same, the, the same question. Helen, I hear you may be mayor here someday, um, maybe governor of the state. But again, I mean, I don't mean to kind of be silly with this question, but oftentimes we think about the policy challenges that we have in front of us in terms of constraints and what political trade-offs we have to do. And I'm just sort of interested in what would a, what would a clean path to getting education that is, that is fair? You, you started out as a, a, as a mom activist. You worried about your childhood. How do we take what you did and make that an experience that every other uh, mom may not have to run for city council, but yet can still get the benefits of, of what you've done? Um, well, I think it starts with organizing. Uh, for me, I came out of 20 years of community organizing in Philadelphia communities, parents, teachers, young people, youth, students, um, school staff, all across the spectrum, faith communities that came together to talk about what was happening with the public school system that is in a state that has the largest funding gap in the nation between the poorest and wealthiest school districts. Pennsylvania has a De deplorable funding system that is dramatically inequitable. Um, whether you want to talk about that at the top level, we can talk about it, what it looks like on the ground. It means our kids don't have water access in schools. It means they go to classrooms that are desperately overcrowded. It means that we fought this year to get a nurse back in every single school. We talk about... 
we talk about literacy and how much it means to us, but our children walk by closed libraries and shuttered computer centers um, at a time when our nation wants to talk about access to technology as being the new frontier. So these mm -hmm. things are going to change. Um, if they're going to change at the top level, they have to start with the parents, teachers, and young people on the ground who are going to fight for these things clearer and with more passion than we're going to see ever in our state assemblies or in D.C. This is going to be a grassroots movement for change, and that's where a lot of my energy has been to encourage parents, single mothers who've raised their children in our city and in our schools to demand justice for their young people and to find a path through it. Let me ask you, what have you, do you feel that you and your advocacy and those that you know in the system have achieved and, and done? And what do you think your next, say, take the next four years, do you think the next big uh, uh, jumps are that you need to, to, to jump over? Um, the most powerful thing we've been able to do is go from a state that 16 years ago we were a state takeover district um, by the state of Pennsylvania, which condemned Philadelphia public schools as being um, deplorable, out of control, couldn't govern themselves, broke, bankrupt, and lacking in vision. And what we've done instead is shown that the state takeover was the thing that lacked vision, that this was a state that refused to tackle funding equity. It was a state that refused to look at inequality in how our school systems are funded, and it was a state that was trying to sell the idea that school choice for some was better than equity for all. And so parents came together with teachers and educators. We built a broad coalition. This was not going to be a divided battle. Um, we organized. We we were in the streets, we were in our school districts, we were in our school classrooms um, fighting for uh, better special education opportunities, openings for access to our immigrant youth. We started an education newspaper because information is key to our communities. We lack it. We have done uh, analyses of the budget. We've run investigations on expanded school choice and how it often doesn't serve all children. Um, we've also started to form organizations that really go out there. We filed hundreds of complaints against the State Department of Education education for their failure to deliver a quality education system for our children. And in September, when uh, we have oral arguments before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, we're going to pack the Supreme Court in City Hall, and we're going to fill it with the voices of people who demand that our state takes funding equity seriously. I bet your calls get returned. It's just that, that's just, I bet your calls get returned. Montserrat, let me ask you, you're from Austin, you're visiting, and uh, uh, welcome to Helen City. Yes, thank um, you. But, thank but you, I, I want to ask you, you've been working in bilingual education, and one yes. of the really interesting questions that I have, and really want to open it to all of you, but is, is, is thinking about the whole child, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we talk about these issues in such a, you know, a sterile way, and such a siloed way. But I think that both culturally, through language, you've kind of been dealing with some other, other parts of this. So uh, tell us about Austin and what needles you're trying to move on the educational front and how important it is for us to sort of broaden our own, our own uh, sense of what that whole child means. Yeah, well, you know, this is the 21st century, uh, and it is important that we integrate bilingualism and the importance of being cu culturally relevant in our classrooms, and that's something that it's happening in Austin. We are a dual language uh, school district where we embrace and we love our children that are coming into our classrooms and we're using their native language um, and using that to learn English. Uh, it's, uh, I'm an English Can language myself. Can I just ask myself. you, do you get pushback in Texas? Yes, we do, but... And how do you handle that? Well, we're saying if we don't invest in our children that are going to be bilingual, bicultural, how is that not going to help our state of Texas? We are next to Mexico in the border, so we do need to invest in our, in our children. We have children that, that are speaking different languages. We have, this year, a thousand students from all over the world in our district. So we, we created different resources that are, we're helping teachers have those resources available, and how do we welcome our children? At the end of the day, we're uh, brain developing, develop uh, and we got to give our children the tools that they need to be successful is in it, this is 21st century. Is it working? Century. Are you feeling like you're uh, uh, hitting some, some home runs? Are you, are you, how, how do you feel the experiment in Austin is going? So we feel that we're, we're feeling good about it. We're organizing. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. Um, we're educating. Uh, we have this motto in, in our local, identify, educate, and mobilize. We're identifying 
people, communities, uh, relationships, we're building those relationships. Uh, we're educating them about the issues, about the importance of being bilingual, about the community schools models uh, that we have in our school district, and then we're asking them to do something about it, to go to the state level, to go to the school district, uh, to really advocate and organize and empower the parents and the teachers to take control of our public schools, because we know best, we are the experts. And I think that speaks volumes of the fact that Austin ISD was uh, in the top 10 school districts in the whole nation of the best public schools. And that, to me, is, is an amazing work that we're doing. And it, it's going to get uh, harder before it gets easier. But we love, we love it, and we're organizing. How, how would you grade Tim Kaine's Spanish? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sophia, let me ask you. You, you, you are um, obviously, what, what's interesting is, is that you've decided in your off time when you're not uh, filming and, and, and being uh, the celebrity off in Hollywood uh, that you are, that, that education matters. And I'm just interested in your journey. Why? What are you trying to do? What are you not trying to do is, is, is may, maybe an even more important question so that, you know, what's the focus? Yeah. So for me, education's always been a passion because I know the way that it changed my life. I know what it was like growing up as a kid going to public school in California. And when I was entering into the seventh grade, my parents chose to put me into a private school. And I was technically a top kid in my class, you know, sort of self-deprecating and like, I'm a bookworm. And, and I got to this private school and I was tragically behind. Hmm. I had so much I had to catch up on. I had so much I had to learn. Luckily, my mother is a powerhouse and said, you're going to have any tutor that you need. We're going to figure out the areas in which you need to sort of close this gap. And it was, it was a shock to me because I had thought that my school was great. And I'd thought that I was learning. Mm -hmm. And I went into this school that absolutely and completely changed my life. Not only did I discover passion for writing and literature in ways that have shaped me as an artist, I also had an arts requirement because it was a school that had the luxury of arts funding. And Was this a, a private school? This was or a, a private school, school in Southern California. Private school. And okay. I had a theater requirement. I had to do a play. And I came home and I told my parents I wasn't going to go to medical school anymore. They were thrilled. Um, I'm, I said, you know, I'm going to be the, I'm going to be an actor. And it was going to college and realizing that I was still so hungry for a broader education that made me leave the theater school, major in journalism, study political science, and all of those gaps, seeing the gaps in my state then, seeing them in every state I've been on location in, working in Austin, working in North Carolina, working in Chicago, talk about a school district that is a mess. Mm -hmm. I, I can't look away from it because I know that the thing that enables you to pursue your dreams the way that I have is an education, and if you don't have it, you can't. And, and the real imperative for me comes from not only the sort of puppies and rainbows story of I went off and I, I get to be an actor and I perform, it's also an economic imperative. We know that in the developing world, women who are educated invest 90% of the profit that they make in their later lives back into their families, back into their children, back into their communities. We know that if we had gender parity, we would raise the GDP by 12%. I know that in the nine years, talking domestically, that I shot a television series in North Carolina, my show brought $259 million in revenue into that state. Mm. So theater, arts education, that should not be an extracurricular. It is an economic imperative for the future of our kids and for our futures in our states and in our governments that they have every opportunity to find their career paths because it might be the extracurricular activity that brings $250 million worth of revenue into your state. Thank you for that. Um, so that's let that. Me, <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you all, when I think about education. One, one of my worries is that as we discuss many issues on stage today, I wonder if we're thinking about structures in an old way, right? Mm -hmm. You were talking about the difference between the private school you were in and the public school you had begun mm -hmm. in. 
and there are debates about, you know, we have, we have almost 100% rate of charter schools in New Orleans right now, and you have a debate on, you know, charter schools sort of started out to be R&D labs to mm -hmm. try to take best practices and, 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 and put them, but there's a tension between uh, public and charters that have grown. And then I, you know, see group, you know, guys like Sal Khan and the Khan Academy uh, on, the, on the upper end basically using, you know, digital platforms to reach uh, millions of people, many of them outside this country, but many of them inside to sort of look at lessons. Even American Federation of Teachers has a share your lesson uh, uh, platform to, to help teachers in schools. I'm wondering how much of what we see as a problem in education can be solved through technology that we're not talking about. We're, we're talking in old ways about education and not new ways about what, what some of these problems can receive. Helen? Um, well, I think that you know technology is always a tool, um, and it's a tool that can be used for good or for um, it can either close the inequity gaps or it can widen them. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, um, what we need to be hyper focused on is this issue of equity and services towards all students. That is my primary goal, both as a public servant, as a mother, and someone who's deeply committed to public education. I am really think it's important to think about. Uh, creative means, exciting means to, to deliver education. But at the end of the day, if they are not fundamentally about bridging the inequity gap, then we have a very, very big problem. Our problem isn't creating measures that can reach some kids and the brightest kids and the most privileged kids um, to do it in more different, dynamic, interesting ways. We have a problem in reaching young people who are often immigrants, non-English speakers. We have a problem reaching students with young people with disabilities. We have a problem reaching parents who don't have online access. We have a problem reaching families uh, who are desperately poor, who are migrant or homeless. And those are the challenges really that we face. The challenge isn't always this, the line of creativity that we can carve out for a very privileged few. The line is what are we going to bring down to the broadest group of people that we can serve. Um, and I do want to caution a little bit because I do think that this idea about education that, that has come up in the last 16 years and two decades has been really an obsessive focus in on structures and management ideals around education rather than the substance and practice of education. Yes. If you want to talk about technology in terms of the substance and practice of it, how we reach young people through it, how we excite their imaginations, and how we open up new worlds for them, I'm happy to be there. An educator should absolutely be at the table, as well as a young student to tell you how well you're doing. Mm -hmm. But if you want to bring a whole bunch of tech companies in with their products and their apps, and they want to sell you this and that um, every single year, that conversation has been had before, just with a different tool, not quite as cute, not quite as fancy. Um, but the substance and practice of education cannot be overshadowed by a, a, a very odd obsession right now with the structure and management of schools um, over, over the real right. practice of it. Montserrat? Yeah, so one of the things that we have in Austin is the community schools model. And six years ago, one of our schools, uh, a wonderful school, neighborhood school, right. was going to be closed. Um, we sat together, uh, the community, uh, the school board members, the, the administrators, the district, and we sat together and said, well, how can we help this wonderful school with our students? We had a needs assessment of all the organizations in the community. How can we help that child that is homeless? How can was we- Was it going to be closed for performance reasons or cost reasons? For, excuse me. Well, it was going to be closed for? For, bo for both. Okay. Okay. And so we sat together and said, well, this is what we knew. It was grassroots organizing. We have been doing that. The school just this year uh, has doubled the attendance, is doing wonderful. And we're having students that are graduating from high school. We, we partner up with the community college, and they're getting credits uh, from the community college graduating from high school, and it's wonderful. We sat down, we said, look at all these wonderful organizations. What is it that the parents need? What is it that the teachers need? What is it that the students need? It wasn't a top down, it was a grassroots, and I think that's the beauty that I'm seeing, and we're opening that up in other schools. And talk about, when we talk about the, the technology, yes, we invited the, the technology side, and we said, how can the technology make our schools better with, asking the teachers who are the experts in the classroom, and we're seeing a very good, successful thing, and we're empowering our members um, and our teachers, and they're building relationships, which is really important. A child who's, who's dad or mom has been deported. As a teacher, I can teach math and science, and they're not going to learn if they're worried about right. their mom or dad being deported. Right. we got to find resources, lawyers, immigration lawyers that can help them, that can tell them, your parent is going to be okay. We're doing uh, a lot of immigration uh, e uh, 
forums where we're telling the parents, these are your rights. These are the rights of a US citizen. It's ridiculous that we have US citizen children in the foster care system because their pa parents have been deported. So that's something that we need to work on the social justice uh, part of it and integrate it into our public schools. Thank you. Sophie, before we go to the audience, I want to ask you, because we have, we have these students from McDowell County here, and I often sort of think about, um, you know, when there are a lot of people who have silver bullet ideas in education, but, mm -hmm. but those that seem most important are those that you can replicate, mm -hmm. that you can scale in the system, and that, that Every, that, that every system can afford. And so within the prism of thinking about McDowell County and the students that are here, what are some of the things that you can do or that you think we can all do to sort of think about those places in the country that may not have an option of a private school uh, mm -hmm. down the street, may not have uh, uh, resources available in the same way. So what, what, what insights have you had from your, your volunteerism and philanthropy? I think that one of the most important things, and I'm thrilled to listen to both of you ladies speak so eloquently, I'm trying to be calm and not be like, yeah, every time you say something. Um, that because, because okay it's okay with me. It, but yeah. it is true. In the same way that I look at the school systems and talk to kids in schools in the communities that I film in, which are all over the country and sometimes out of the country, I listen to each of you talk, and the key is that you have to listen to the educators in each community. In the same way that you couldn't offer a blanket statement for how to make every marriage in America work, you can't offer a blanket statement for how each classroom is supposed to function on some even performance scale measuring system. It, do it doesn't work. I think that when we empower our educators, I think that when we empower parents in every community that when we can inspire people to show up, listen, learn what's happening in their classrooms, and when the government then comes in and does say every child gets to succeed, every child will have equal opportunities, when we're closing those gaps in funding and we have people on the ground in each community, we can then apply specific resources mm -hmm. to specific need because the needs are not the same everywhere. And we have to right. start equalizing those places and we have to start closing those gaps. And then I think more scalable models get easier. Thank you. I'm shaking my head because my team is trying to shut me down and I'm not <laughs> going to do it yet. This is too cool. So where are the mics? We're going to have the mics. Um, right up here. Uh, I want to go to Destiny. I want to have our friend at the libraries over here in a second. We're going to do a lightning round set of questions, do this Quick end. Destiny, did, was anything up here said relevant to you? Yes, a lot of things you said were relevant, but I want to ask each of you, how do you, think, do you, how do you think you're going to inspire the people in our county specifically? Because just because we're poverty stricken and we have the same economic problems as everyone else, it doesn't discredit the potential that we have in the county. So what do you think that should change to show us that we have that potential? Because we've been stripped of our identity and demonize to the whole country. So we need help in encouraging our students and the, mm -hmm. everyone that helps the students. I mean, Can I ask you a quick question? If, 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 we, if, if we turned you into Ellen up here and you were embarrassed, what would you do? I mean, do you have any thoughts from things you've heard of things you'd like to see be different about what's going on with the ecosystem you have about how education is handled? Of course, I'd, yeah. I would want to encourage the teachers because we're, we live in a time now where the teachers are discouraged because of the outcome of how the education system is. We right. have a, a buku of students that just So drop morale out. is low. Exactly. No one yeah. is excited about education anymore because you can just drop out and get a minimum wage, and that's not acceptable anymore. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. But reactions to, to Destiny. Um, Wonderful name, by the one way. Of it's the perfect. One the things I'm most proud of in Philadelphia is how vibrant our student activism movement has come up um, over the last 20 years. And sometimes it's not like young people, like, you know, just want to go out and have to do all these things, become political, run studies on their, uh, you know, um, run studies on their schools and their school districts, you know, have a disagreement with their teachers or their principals or the school district itself and their superintendent. But it was so important that young Young people like yourself who say that they don't often feel like they have visibility and voice, they can't even be mm. seen, much less heard um, in a district, 
we have to organize. And so for me, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out vehicles to organize. So we're present when there was a school discipline issue involving a school resource officer who was very uh, using excessive force against a young person. So we're out there, we're supporting them, we're helping them uh, bring some resolution to that situation. We ran several education town halls that drew out young people who demanded water access in schools. That led to uh, rewriting of our plumbing code, opening up all the water fountains and, and having us um, make sure that the school district buy a million dollars worth of cold water hydration stations. So young people organizing, they've walked out in Philadelphia, they've marched for their teachers, they've marched for bigger things, um, for better curriculum, for teachers in the classroom, for reopening their libraries. Those are the things that make change, not from the top, but always from the young people themselves. Quick, quick thoughts. I, I think it's imperative that we as teachers sit with our students and that we listen to you. What is it that you want? How can we work together to have the best education possible? And it's happening in our district. We get to sit down and have those conversations in community uh, sessions with our with our students. And you have the answer. We and one of the things that I think it's imperative is that we have more teachers of color in our classrooms because that's the way I remember my my pre-k my elementary teacher when I saw her and Mrs. Hernandez and she welcomed me to the classroom I wanted to be just like her and it is mm. she's the reason why I'm a, I am a teacher now because she loved our students she spoke in Spanish to me and I, I didn't speak a word of English and to me that spoke volumes so we need to do that, that a, a better job on Sophia, that. Sophia, quick thoughts? And I agree, you've got you've to gotta organize. You speak so eloquently. You know what's happening in your community. And I think about being a student, and I, I stay in touch with my English teacher from high school and one of my journalism professors from college. They are two educators who told me I could do anything, that my voice mattered. Your voice matters, and you know who the teachers are who might be exhausted like you are, but who still care and who still have fight in them. And if you get some friends together, if you get some teachers together, and you start talking about ways that you can run your own study on your school, that you can cause some noise, that you can use those voices to engage and motivate your community and get the attention of legislators, do it because you're powerful. You don't have to wait to make change until you're up here on a panel like us. You can make change tomorrow. It, it matters and you matter right now. Thank you. Before we close, I want to take one last question. I promised it at the bar. Again, I, 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 you can tell I tilt towards the bar. I admit it. Uh, we have my friend who just handed me something. He said, nearly 95% of Philadelphia public schools lack a functioning library. Uh, this is your opportunity to pose a question or comment. Okay, my name's and tell us who you are. Yeah, my name is Barbara Dowdle. I'm a retired English teacher here in Philadelphia. I taught. Um, that's one of, the, one of the results of the state takeover. Uh, the uh, closing of our libraries. Uh, I was in a technical high school, and we talk about students, well, they don't have to go to college, they can be in trades. Those uh, textbooks in those trades are a higher reading level than anything else the students are reading in high school. So we need the libraries because that's where they're going to develop an interest. Quick reactions, closing words. So, Sophie? Oh, Ma Ma go ahead. So, so with the AFT, we have this program. We work with First Book, which they have low uh, books for low prices, and they have multicultural books, which as a teacher, I think it's wonderful to have that available. We've given many book drives and, and given the, the books for free to the kids, and that, that right there, I think there's a lot of different ways where you can engage, engage with your union. I'm from a merch local. I love the NEA and the AFT and having them uh, in their powerhouse. I'm learning from them and organizing to get the resources that perhaps the district is not giving me. They're giving me those tools and the, un the union is really strengthening the power of, of our union by empowering teachers to take charge in our school districts and taking them over. Helen, Fantastic. Tobia. <laughs> uh, the, uh, form, well, yes, form. I yeah. want to thank Barbara and all the people in this room who've been fighting on the issue of not only just school libraries, but but what's actually happening for resources in schools. Um, what we're looking for is to build a baseline access for all students in all schools. It's a sad state 
um, in Philadelphia and across the country that we do not have a floor for the basic level of education. People always talk about every student succeeding. We can have school classrooms with 70 students in a classroom, shuttered buildings, literacy rates in the toilet, and uh, kids in high poverty. So if those things are going to change, uh, the majority of us, uh, the parents, student, local politicians, um, are going to have to set the baseline standard for what the floor is going to be and go out there and demand it. We're going to organize with our labor allies. We've got to bring together our faith communities. Um, it's got to be a broad-based effort to make that happen. At the end of it comes money, but at the beginning has to come the vision, the power, and the organizing to make those things possible. But um, with the power in this room, I know 20 years of community organizing that Barbara's helped lead and others in this room, um, we are going to try to make that possible. Wow. So, Sophia? Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the only way I've ever seen any real change happen is with organizing, is with planning, is with bringing multiple groups across different verticals together. And I agree with you, there is no more important issue than our kids being educated and having access to education resources. So in whatever ways you can rally your community, and when you rally your community, use your internet and rally us because I'm the first person when somebody reaches out to me with an issue like this who's going to blast it out nationwide to millions of people and I know there are so many education activists like myself who want to help draw attention to the good work that you're doing and you know if if we can be irritating to the powers that be and highlight your issues please I love to make some noise let me let me know Look, we're right near the end, but you, you mentioned unions, Montserrat, and I just want to um, drill down here for a minute. Uh, because unions are part of the, the debate, and, and, and some people think they help, some people think they hurt. I, I'm just going to ask you, you know, with, you know, pretend you're sort of in a risk-free zone, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think unions get wrong? And, and what do you think they get right? I mean, I'm interested in sort of a, a, a reflective moment of, of when you're trying to sort of think about everything, what does the institution provide that's great? What do you think it's not not doing that it should be doing? I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings and there, there's a lot of hate towards unions. Uh, in my experience, uh, has been very positive. And, you know, it, it's, we're doing the bread and butter issues that we have to do because that's what unions do, but we're really integrating the social justice and giving teachers and counselors and social workers the resources that they need. We're building relationships with the people that matter in our communities. And, you so know, that's the good side. That's the wonderful and, and, side. And the bad side? You know, I don't, I don't like to say there's a good or a bad side. I think. There's always time to, to get better. <laughs> There's always time, things that we can get better, and uh -huh. we're working on that. Um, I think we as teachers need to be empowered and say we are the experts, and we need to embrace that and make sure that we have younger teachers being part of our union, and we're doing a great job about it. We still have a long way to go, but I'm a proud union member, um, and I will tell the world that we're working, and we're, it's a working process. Any, any downsides? Can, any, anybody can help me with the downsides here? Um, so I think that one of the I don't mean downsides. I mean, what, 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 what are they missing? What are they not getting? What could they do better in? There's got to be something. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, there's always things. But, you know, one of the challenges that we're facing right now is that uh, the children... Um, who are going to our public schools are increasingly diversifying and our teacher force has to diversify. Um, how we do that, uh, with what means we're going to do that, that's always going to be a challenge and that's got to be an internal as well as an external kind of union issue um, and being super vocal about that is going to really energize um, that. Um, and the difference is, is that I think that our nationals get it done really well um, but when it drills down to different localities it can be much more diverse and different and I think that um, each locality embracing that broader message of uh, diversifying our, our teacher force and, and our staff force is really critical. The other thing that, um, if I could be a little bit more, um, you know, uh, thoughtful about has been, you know, the teachers union contract, here in Philadelphia, we're four years without a teachers union contract. It's been a killer. And in the meantime, the, uh, our state takeover body has chosen to essentially rip up the contract, do whatever they want. And in fact, what they end up doing is not putting teachers in the classroom. This year, thousands of kids will go to school, summer school in Philadelphia, 
uh, not because they needed extra help or because they're going for enrichment, but because they didn't have a teacher in the classroom for the right. majority of the year. So um, teachers' contracts are frequently debated behind closed doors with a bunch of lawyers. Mm -hmm. I think that this is a huge contract about the future of how we want our public schools to look. We could break that open a little bit to have a broader conversation about what parents' communities and young people actually want to see in the teachers' contract. They are, for better right. or for worse, the only protection, legal protection that we've got. So we have a stake in that, and opening that up, I think, is it would be beneficial. A few seconds, just finish this up. Yeah, obviously, I don't work in a teacher's union, but I've had the pleasure of sitting in on many meetings and, and learning incredible amounts about our education system from them. And I agree with you, the more that they're open and the more access you have to better deals is only going to make our students' lives better. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been really fun. I'm sorry I went over, but it was just too good to stop. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Destiny. Thank you so much for <laughs> outstanding. And Montserrat Garibay, Helen Jim, and Sophia Bush, thank you all so much for this. This is a wonderful thank conversation. You. Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.